welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Foothill College, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Today's guest is a modern-day Renaissance man who was born in New York City. Throughout his life, he's loved model airplanes. In addition to designing and building model airplanes, our guest has invented and collected a large number of toys. He attended Brentwood, he attended Brentwood a tough high school known as Home of the Hoods, where he was undoubtedly the only student with a Tech 503 oscilloscope in his home lab. Our guest earned a BS in mathematics from the State University of New York and a master's in computer science from Penn State, but pursued a PhD in music from the University of California at San Diego, where, at 26, he became the youngest professor in the University of California system. Our guest is an accomplished composer and musician, having composed many pieces and performed many concerts. He's an artist, having had his work exhibited many places, including the Museum of Modern Art. Combining music and computers, our guest set up the original electronic music studio at Penn State and went on to help initiate curricula and computer music at many other universities. He's a prolific writer. He served as editor or written for a myriad of magazines, including Model Airplane News, The Silicon Gulch Gazette, later Double E Times, Dr. Dobbs Journal, Byte, 73, Personal Computing, Kilobaud, Interface Age, and my new favorite, Midnight Engineering. He's also had academic papers published by many journals, including Nature and the ACM. Our guest is an entrepreneur. He's founded four companies and built many products. Our guest was a member of the Homebrew Computer Club and was even featured in Programmers at Work. He's an inventor. He's been awarded at least seven patents, not to mention his unpatented inventions, which include the combined editing and programming environment, the one-button mouse, the Apple Macintosh, and the work processor. Our guest is currently a successful private consultant specializing in computer human interface design. And so it's now my pleasure to welcome to our program a true Renaissance man. He's an artist, he's a composer, he's a musician, he's an entrepreneur, he's a writer, he's a visionary and inventor of the Macintosh. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. It's Jeff Raskin. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. So, congratulations on uh, your uh, latest human-human interface project. Thank you. I understand, uh, well, we weren't able to do this a week ago because you were having, or your family was having a baby. Right. So, again, my congratulations. And uh, I guess we're going to start out and talk about model airplanes. And, uh, you designed first, I guess, a radically inexpensive model airplane called the Western Wind, I see. Um, what, was, what made it so radically inexpensive? Well, an, an ex-student of mine, uh, actually was a student at the time, named Bill Atkinson, uh, was trying to learn how to fly radio control down at La Jolla, and uh, he built this Walsawood airplane, threw it off the cliff, refused any kind of help. If you know Bill, you know, he would refuse mm -hmm. any kind of help, and the uh, thing promptly crashed and smashed. So I said, what the world needs? It's something that doesn't cost $60, $70 or more, doesn't take 40, 50 hours to build. So I designed a cardboard radio-controlled airplane. Oh, really? There's a picture of it here? picture of it here, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. And the thing sold for $12.95. You could mm -hmm. build it in a single uh, afternoon. And uh, if you crashed it, it wouldn't break. It would just, you know, why do they ship things in cardboard boxes? You know, it just dents a little bit. You get a hole, you bend throw, it. You throw it off the... Uh, Replace it. Yeah. That's great. So you brought some other uh, airplanes along with you too, I guess, or airplane pieces here. I well, see. Uh, yeah, to help kids get started, I designed this this airplane. But to make it easy to build, I wanted to have uh, I wanted to just print the parts on a piece of wood. It's a very old technique, but I do it with a laser printer. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, use a CAD program on my Mac and. Uh, you cut out the pieces, and finally, when you get it all done, you have a uh, oh. model airplane. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's see. Patented automatic return feature. There you go. I don't know if people got a chance, but it looks, you know, yeah, they can see it whenever. 
So I see you also brought this, uh, looks like a pond dragon. But, uh, no. This is a, uh, a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to teach myself how to do uh, machining. So as a, sort of a project to see if I'd really mastered it, I designed myself a five-cylinder radial engine. It has a... Kind of hold it still for a little sure. bit. Sure. Yeah. Okay. It has a total displacement of uh, 0.025 cubic inches. In five cylinders. In five cylinders. That's total, right? Incredible. It's probably one of the smallest ever built. Yeah, you got, yeah the back there, I can see some tiny yeah. screws. Yeah. So, so you also uh, play music. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I guess you brought uh, a score to show us of some music that you've composed. Well, this is, uh, this is volume one of a three-volume set that was just published mm -hmm. by uh, Lou Music in New York, and it's available in most music shops. Uh, Okay, let's see what's in, inside here. It's a nice cover. It looks like, uh, reminds me okay. of our uh, video synthesis kind so, of stuff. So, needless to say, of course, the entire thing was typeset on my Mac at home. Well, I didn't know that. It doesn't <laughs> look like it was made on a computer at all. Well, that's the whole point. Yes, it is. Well, the whole point is that it uses the familiar interface that all musicians know and love, and just the dreadful thing called music no, mm -hmm. no notation. But using computer, this is, I'm, the reason I got started building computers mm -hmm is because I wanted things that would help me do what I like to do. I like writing, uh, so I built computers that do good, good word processing. Uh, I originally made a, uh, back in the 60s, I did a music font. It was very, very hard to use mm -hmm. a huge mainframe to do music. Now I can do this at home. It plays it for me. I can uh, proof, proof it much more quickly by just listening to it. Comes out with this, I can send this to a publisher. They don't have to set it. I know that there are no errors in it, or if there are any, it's, it's it, my fault. It's your fault, yeah, right. And then, which is another great time saver, any of the music programs will take this. There's four, four parts for a quartet here. But you've got to give each musician one part. So it takes each part, mm -hmm. extracts it automatically, and then, and then you get okay. parts out. So instead of having to copy these over by hand or hire somebody to do that Good. and wondering if they get it right. Or cutting and pasting. All, all those kinds of things. It's all done yeah. fairly painlessly, I guess. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, if, if computer interfaces were any good, I'd quit working on them now because I have most of the tools that I originally set out to build. I see. Well, that's, that's an interesting way to, to look at it. Now, you built a digital electronic tuner, I noticed, one of the patents you have. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's an invention that um, not only tells whether an instrument is in tune or not, but would also take, like on a piano, you have these tuning pegs. And then you have mm -hmm. this, uh, normally you have a piano tuner who's got to tune all these strings. Yeah, and usually the pegs are stuck in the wood so right. that they won't turn. And so I just invented something that listens to the note, and if it's too sharp, it turns it one way. If it's too flat, it turns it the other way, and it just tunes the instrument automatically. Uh, it must have an awfully powerful motor. I mean, that, but that's a pretty, pretty simple feedback mechanism. Yeah, it's, it's geared way down. For some reason, nobody seemed to have ever done it before. I'd, I'd sure like to have one. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have to worry about keeping your piano in tune. You could just, yeah, do it whenever. So um, you also do artworks. And uh, mm -hmm. could you say a little bit about that? I, you didn't bring any with you, I guess, but I understand that's, that's because they're too big. Well, I haven't uh, been an active artist for a long time. But when I was doing it, most of my works were mm -hmm. very large scale sculpture, tens of thousands of cubic feet, um, things, environmental things with people in them. I see. Well, that's, that's come into vogue in the last couple of years now, really. Well, in vogue then, too. <laughs> Yeah, so you've exhibited. Well, it, was, I guess, it wasn't in vogue; it was an art news and art world. Yeah. Right, right. Well, that's great. I mean, I guess you exhibited at L.A. County Museum yeah, of Art as well yeah. as uh, New York. Had some so. graphics in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's hard to beat that. Anyway, well, we have to take a break now. So, uh, Jeff invented the Apple Macintosh, and he's going to tell us about that in a minute. See you on the other side. <sighs> For some people, doing their basic tax forms by themselves can make them feel like they're climbing the walls. I'm Renee. My name is, my full name is, I remember that, dependent. If you need help, free tax help is available from IRS trained volunteers. Find them by calling 1-800-424-1040. They'll make your taxes less taxing. Racers are prepared for danger. The probability is there. You don't even start a race car without your seatbelt on. Without it, I wouldn't even be here. 
Me and I know what to expect on a track. It's driving with amateurs on the highway that scares me. Drive like a pro. Buckle up. Hi, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome back to High Tech Heroes. We're talking with Jeff Raskin today, and now he's going to tell us about inventing the Macintosh. So Jeff, how did the Macintosh come about? At that time at Apple, I was talking about um, uh, 1979, September of 1979. The projects that were in the works was the Apple III with the Apple III and the Lisa. And uh, I went to Mike Markle and I said that I didn't think that the Apple III had a technical pizzazz to take us into the future. And I thought that Lisa was going to be overpriced right. and uh, too slow. And so I proposed this thing which I called Macintosh, which I named after my favorite variety of Apple. And uh, wow. changed the spelling to, so we wouldn't have a conflict with Macintosh Labs. And, oh, yeah, who and used, to, used to make stereo equipment, right? Yeah, still do. And um, so I wanted something that would be small, be a lot easier to use than anything that was then available, and relatively inexpensive. My interest has always been on making things easy to use, pleasant to use. and. Uh, instead of having the focus that most people in the Valley did at the time of using the latest processor or the latest memory chip, that's what people talked about, this processor, well, that processor. Actually, uh, HUD and I, the director and I, were at Atari at the time, and we, uh, we were there stuck building 6502 machines. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got some photos of the inside of a Macintosh, and we more or less all quit. <laughs> <laughs> because we thought, uh, well, at least these guys have gone up to 16 bits. But, uh, so how did the one, one button mouse come about? Well, in the early 70s, I was a uh, visiting scholar at Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Lab, and I had an honorary beanbag chair over at Xerox Park. And I saw what they were doing there. I thought a lot of it was really, really great. Um, the bitmap screens, yeah, yeah. and they had this three-button mouse. And I couldn't keep track of which button was, was which. Yeah, I still can't. And so, <laughs> and so when I came to create the Macintosh project, I thought a lot about how we could make it easier to use. And I realized you could do all the things you had to do with a one-button mouse. It took me a while to convince people it was possible, but eventually we did. And well, uh, it's a very natural thing to just grab something and move it. I mean, what could be more natural? But in hindsight, that's easy to see, I guess. Well, was I mean, the, was the, the, the three-button mouse you, you can grab and move things too, but the one-button mouse just a lot easier. Yeah, but you, you don't usually grab three things. No. Or, you know, um, I guess was there a flash or some time that came? It just came to you that. You can do it with one button, or you no, tried? Or? It was something that I've been working on for, for a long time. I said, we have a three-button mouse, too hard to use. Can I make it with two buttons? Yeah. Can I make it with one button? Can I make it with no buttons? Oh, yeah. I, I know how to make it with no buttons, but I couldn't convince any, anybody. I, I had a similar experience at RCA. They, they uh, had a, a remote that had 68 buttons, and the next one was going to have 83. <laughs> and they said, that's too many. So I built a one-button remote for them. And they said, that's not the way we do things. And I said, well, that was the point. Anyway. Um, so um, I guess you have something about floppy disks, too. Uh, well, what you, why, why do we have to format floppy disks now? The very phrase you uh, used, um, we don't do things that way, mm -hmm. is almost uh, exactly what happened to me. Uh, when we were putting the first floppy disk drive on the Apple II, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Wozniak and Randy Wigginton were working on it. And in those days, uh, I pretended that I didn't know anything about com computers, so I could say, I was, I was in charge of writing manuals, so I could say, right. you know hardware, you know software, I know how to write manuals, I don't tell you how to design hardware, you don't tell me how to write manuals. And that way I could run things pretty well. And you, in fact, well. kept your de degree a secret, didn't you? That's right. I didn't, <laughs> well, you didn't have to fill out, I was the 31st employee, and you didn't mm -hmm. have to fill out any kinds of forms, so nobody knew what kind oh. of background you had. So did you, no forms, you didn't have to sign an intellectual property agreement? Nothing. I, I never signed anything like that. No. Oh, well, so, I mean, <laughs> presumably you could collect on the Macintosh then. That. Anyway, um, so uh, they were they were working on it, and I was writing the manual for the disk drive, and they had this thing, this init command, which is disk disk formatting command. So I'm playing dumb, and I come in and I say, uh, mm -hmm. "What does this command do? I don't understand it." And they say, "Well, you see, before you can write on a floppy disk, you got to put all these little marks on it." And I said, "Yeah, but it's spinning around. Why can't you do that while you're writing the data?" Of course, I knew very well you could. Um, and I'd taken more computer science probably than anybody else in the company at the time. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so they thought about it for a while, and Waz said, yeah, that's technically possible. Uh, let me make sure I understand the scheme. So the scheme would be you've got an unformatted disk. Mm -hmm. You um, put it in the computer. The computer wants to write something. 
So it just writes as much directory and then as much tracking information as it has as, to. As it, as it needs at the So you have to write a whole track at a time, I guess, of sectoring information. Well, it's, sectoring I, don't, I, don't wanna, I don't really care okay. about the technical view. I guess, the, I guess the important thing is that... Sort of trailblaze and just make uh, available what you need. Yeah, but however it works inside, the important thing mm -hmm. is that the user would never have to know about formatting, would never have to waste time doing it. So uh, think about, hey, there's over 50 million personal computers. Uh -huh. Everybody has at least 10 diskettes. Every single yes, one of those had to be formatted. 10. Each one of those takes two minutes. Well, I've calculated it out. And if you took out all that person power that's been wasted on formatting diskettes, mm -hmm. you could have had 10 more pyramids in Egypt. I mean, there's all kinds of things could have, could have been done. It's a great waste of time. And I got that. And when I asked, when after I explained why it would be better, and I explained to Waz and mm -hmm. Randy, one of them, I don't remember which one, said, well, it's not done that way. Yeah, nobody does it that and way. And because of that one sentence, just think, if Apple had done it that way, that was the first floppy on a little portable, I think, right. on a, on a yeah. little uh, a home com com computer. It was one of the first. Mm -hmm. Then it would have been so much better. Everyone, everybody would have had to have done it. We would have saved literally millions of person hours of, of time. But just because of the it's not done that way syndrome, people have had to format disks. Well, it's certainly taken a lot of my time. Now, a lot of people think that Macintosh is really great, though, because of the uh, graphical user interface. Now, you, br you, in fact, brought a Macintosh with you. Is there something special about this Macintosh? Yeah, it's the it's a millionth Macintosh. It was given to me, uh, I think, March 17th. Uh, and that looks like a Mac Plus. Yeah, it was, well, it was back from 1987. That is literally, would you believe that that's the only recognition I've ever gotten from Apple? either financial or otherwise, for creating the Macintosh project. They're probably afraid to. You know, look what, <laughs> look what happened when they uh, talked about Apple Records. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, uh, so about the graphical user interface. Now, that's really the thing that distinguishes the Macintosh, and people think that was really a great thing, and, and that makes it a great computer. Uh, I mean, do you agree with that? Uh, it was a real distinct improvement over what came be before. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from Xerox Park and a lot of their influence shows in it, plus a lot of stuff that I did and that lots of people who came after me at Apple added to and improved. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Macintosh is not, you know, any computer is not a one-person project. I started it got, it, got it going, but lots of other people uh, made a lot of con contributions to it. But the interface is now, it's 1992. That interface based, based on work from 1972. In those 20 years, people say that this industry goes fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, it drags its feet. Um, <laughs> it's just because uh, we haven't had any real improvements in the interface, except for one or two projects that I've seen uh, mm -hmm. in, in a decade now. So um, you were going to show something, I think, about uh, good versus better? Well, that's, you know, you s people think that the Macintosh interface and the other ones that are, that are like it, the various windowing interfaces, are good. But I think that they're not, they're actually quite terrible. The other day I hooked up, I um, networked my portable to, to another Mac that I have. Whenever you turn off the main Mac, the uh, dialog box appears on all the other machines on the network saying it's gone off, it goes down. So the portable won't shut itself off, so it'll run down its batteries. You know, little things like, like, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's better than what came before, but it's not good. Can I show you an example of typical better good con con confusion? Sure, sure. Uh, because a lot of people get very con confused about this. OK, so what's okay, the Once example? upon a time, it's a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, as I tell my kids every night, f there were these five and a quarter inch floppies. I think that a few K people still use them. And it's square. It can be inserted eight ways into a drive. One of those eight ways work. It's an awkward size, can be easily bent or damaged. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you're writing it with a ballpoint pen, you can, you can ruin it. You can touch it here to spoil the diskette. And to set the right protect notch requires that you put tape on it. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see what happened. I'm going to quote from a book, very excellent book that I recommend to everybody, The Psychology of Everyday Things by Professor Don Norman, a colleague of mine down at UCA uh, San Diego. Mm -hmm. and, and now here is a man whose specialty is human interfaces, a yes. cognitive psychologist and one of the best I think there is. So I'm not attacking him when I quote from his book about the m more modern uh, three and a half inch floppy. He said, a simple example of good design is the three and a half inch magnetic for diskette for computers, a small circle of floppy magnetic material encased in, a hard, in hard plastic. A sliding metal cover protects the magnetic surface, mm -hmm. clearly an improvement over the old one, when yeah, you could just absolutely. touch it, uh, and automatically opens when the diskette is inserted. The diskette has a square shape. There are apparently eight possible ways to insert it, only one of which is correct. What happens if I do it wrong? I try inserting the disk sideways. 
ah, the designers thought of that. A little study shows that the case isn't really square. It's rectangular. If you put it in backwards, it doesn't work. And he ends up saying, an excellent design. Yes? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But dumb. It's nearly square, so it's not easy to tell. The difference is only 5%. The tiny corner cut, well, which way does it go? It can be inserted four ways, only one seat. But it looks like it can, it can be inserted be, it can eight, be ways. eight ways. It, can, it looks like it can okay. be inserted eight ways. It mm -hmm. can only be inserted four. Um, the it depends on if you're Phil Rackety or not. He can actually <laughs> plug the wrong number of pins into a socket. Yeah, Phil, if you're strong, you can do anything. The sliding right protect tab is permanently attached, an improvement, but it's sometimes very hard to operate. I have a friend with very short fingernails. He, he, he can't. Um, does fit into a shirt pocket. Mm -hmm. But, okay. okay, so that is definitely better than it went before. Right. But Dr. Norman felt it was really good. Well, when I showed him this, he said, oh, Raskin, you're, you're right. I fell into the better uh, good trap. Um, right. Here's how perhaps a disc, uh, floppy would be better designed. It's, it can be inserted uh, clearly. It's clear mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. way it, it goes in, nice and rounded, so it slips in very easily. Since these things are two-sided, it doesn't matter whether you put it in right side up or upside down. The computer could figure out which side is which. Who cares? Um, the, why isn't the right protect notch in the back of the diskettes, you can change it after you put it into the machine. That's an interesting... People, people uh, always want to, to do that. You could even design the drive so you could look down and, uh, and see the label. Um, this, I don't claim this is good. This is mm -hmm. much, much better. But what happens is that when people get too close to uh, the present-day mm -hmm. interface, they, they really hated what came before. They tried the Macintosh. It's considerably better, but it isn't good. In fact, it's absolutely dreadful. Right. Well, so now you um, actually went on to try and improve on the Macintosh, I guess. No, it just went in different direction. A different direction mm -hmm. with uh, with information appliance, right? Mm -hmm. Where I guess Dave Calkins and some some other, at least we worked with him at, at Packet Technologies, which mm -hmm. is where some of these props came from. <laughs> but um, you brought along a tape to roll in to demonstrate that to yeah. us. So this is this is going to show just one tiny little uh, Im improvement in cursor motion. Uh, I really hate using a mouse. It's sort of a hand-to-mouse existence. It's <laughs> tiresome. Uh, for working around text, mm -hmm. uh, take a look at this tape. OK. Sure. So this is uh, the Canon Cat, or the? This is uh, an invention, patent invention called Leap, which was used by Canon on, on the Cat. It looks like maybe we have some technical difficulties with the tape. So, uh, it's probably coming in a satellite feed. Oh, here we go. Leap is an inexpensive technology that brings many benefits to its users. Most of the time spent at a computer or terminal is devoted to data entry and editing. Just as we've gone from cursor control keys to the mouse in the past few years, watch as we now move from the mouse to Leap. Oops. That phrase should be enterprise computing. How will our typist correct it? The first step is to move the cursor to the error. Moving the cursor is one of the most frequent operations performed in using a computer. So any improvement here can significantly increase productivity. Cursor control keys, the most universally used method, typically repeat 10 times a second after a half second delay. It takes four and a half seconds just to get halfway across a standard 80-character line. Let's watch our typist move to the error using cursor control keys. User testing has shown that the average time to move the cursor between two randomly chosen locations on a standard display is about seven seconds. Users soon learn that they can speed the process with special commands for moving the cursor to ends of lines by typing words and other ways. But these added commands are hard to learn and increase the user's mental effort. Now, our typist will get to the error using the mouse. Oops. This took nearly three seconds. The mouse is not only faster, but the number of commands and techniques the user has to learn is smaller. Our typist will now find the error using leap. Oops. With leap, the average move takes about one and a half seconds. This move took less than one second.
In many experiments, LEAP has been shown to be uniformly faster than any other cursor moving technique. So, well, that's, um, that's very interesting. It looks uh, like it's better to use. So why isn't it everywhere? Uh, that's a very good question. Why isn't it everywhere? Um, one thing I have found, which uh, may reflect on why the United States is doing so poorly competitively in many fields, is that the only companies that have seemed really interested in it, with only one recent exception, have been com company, uh, country, uh, Countries, companies, companies, right, okay. in uh, Japan and Germany. Right, okay. And uh, it's just that people, again, I think it's partly the good, better, everybody's into the mouse, the mouse is the trendy thing. Well, it's certainly a lot Things. better than what came before in some ways. Of course, I had my arm in a sling last week, so it does have its, <laughs> its problems. But you, you still need a graphic input device for, for graphics. Yeah. So we're out of time. So um, thanks for yeah. watching High Tech Heroes. and. Uh, be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when world-famous graphics expert Bruce McDiffitt will be here from Industrial Light and Magic to relate his vision of the future. Au revoir. So, again, gone in a flash. Thank you for joining us this week for High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when we will bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Margie Foote, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant week. Au revoir. <laughs> This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Linksys Incorporated of Lafayette, Indiana, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, Behind the Scenes Software Incorporated of West Lafayette, Indiana, and Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California.